Evening, everybody. This is Hugh and Hook speaking, and this is the Real Review Live, doing a, um, a tasting of winter reds. And welcome to everybody. We think there's um, at least 140 people who are participating, which is great to see. And I've heard that some of you have been able to order some wines from the wineries or perhaps from your own bottle shops. Um, Otherwise, if you don't have a bottle that we're tasting, just open something else that's similar and sip along with us. Have a bit of fun. It's an interactive format, so we will take some questions and every two, we'll taste every two wines, we'll do some, some questions and then move on to the next two. So um, we're going to have some fun tonight because these are really good wines and um, they're, they're affordable wines too, which is the other most important thing. Um, winter time, of course, cold weather needs something hearty and warming in your stomach to, uh, to keep you uh, comforted and to go with the rich foods that we tend to eat at uh, winter time. So we're going to taste eight high quality reds priced between $25 and $45. All of them achieved high scores on the Real Review. Several of them got 96 points even. And we'll be tasting various different varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Shiraz, blends of Cabernet and Merlot and Cabernet and Shiraz. And the wines will span six different regions of Australia. So from Margaret River to Langhorne Creek, from the Great Southern to Coonawarra, Barossa, Eden Valley and McLaren Vale. So grab your glass, pull up a chair and let's go. The first wine we're tasting tonight is three drops Cabernet Franc. Three drops Cabernet Franc, there it is. A bit hard to show the label, it's a wraparound kind of label. I'll pour myself a, a little bit of this wine, let it sit in the glass for a minute and absorb a bit of oxygen, which won't do it any harm. Three drops is from the great southern region of Western Australia. Um, that's the Mount Barker Franklin River region. Um, and this is a, a winery that is not particularly old, but um, it was only, I think the first wine was made in 2001, but they've already established themselves very well in the market. Thanks mainly to the marketing efforts of their public face, who is Joanne Bradbury. Um, Joanne and her husband started the vineyard and started producing the wines uh, when they took over the family farm that Joanne's father had established back in the 1970s. And um, what they also did, apart from planting vines and establishing a vineyard, is they have 2,000 olive trees as well, and they produce olive oil, very good olive oil, I'll add. And so that's where the name of the winery comes in, Three Drops. Uh, the Three Drops are, in fact, wine, olive oil, and the water, which is necessary to grow any crop in that area. So quite a, I like the name, it's a, a really nice name. There are three, there used to be anyway, three leaves on the label. Now it's gone a bit more arty. Beautiful, good stuff. So Joanne Bradbury is the, uh, is the boss there. They don't have a winery, they get Rob Deletti to make the wine for them. Rob Deletti is, um, Mr. You know, he's one of the, the great uh, contract winemakers of Western Australia. He operates at his family's vineyard, which is um, uh, Castle Rock Estate, which is down a bit further south in the Perongrup region of the Great Southern. Um, he's an outstanding winemaker. So you've got great fruit, great location, great winemaker, and the result is a terrific wine. This wine is straight Cabernet Franc, and it's the first time they've made a straight Cabernet Franc at, at three drops. 2018. Um, previously, the Cabernet Franc went into their Bordeaux blend. They still make a Bordeaux blend, but they've kept some of the Cabernet Franc out to make, a, to make this wine. Cabernet Franc, of course, is one of the Bordeaux grape varieties. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdo are the three, are the five varieties of Bordeaux. Cabernet Franc is not usually seen as a straight varietal in this part of the world, in Australia. We're seeing more of them now. I think it's been a bit overlooked in the past. Um, there are certainly people such as Franklin Estate in the same region as this who are making um, Cabernet Franc a bit of a feature of their vineyard as well. So the Great Southern seems to be a, a good place for Cabernet Franc. 
Um, I guess apart from Bordeaux, the Loire Valley is the other place where Cabernet Franc is famous in the world of wine. Um, the famous wines of Chinon, Bourgoy, people, and places like that in the uh, San Nicolas de Bourgoy in, uh, in the Loire Valley. Um, they make pure Chenin Blanc, uh, uh, Cabernet Franc wines there. Chinon is a light bodied wine. Uh, it never makes as heavy a wine as Cabernet Sauvignon makes and not as tannic as Cabernet Sauvignon. So a good wine to start with. Let's have a taste. Beautiful color, very bright, very limpid, purple tinge to it, fresh, uh, vibrant color. You know it's going to be a nice fresh wine when you look at it. And it is, the nose is very typical of the variety. It's got crushed leaves, mulberry leaves, raspberry. The raspberry is very much the Cabernet Franc signature, but always a bit of leafiness, perhaps more intense Cabernet-like aromas than Cabernet Sauvignon even. Uh, very perfumed, very high-toned and lifted. Let's taste it. Mm. And beautiful flavor. Medium bodied, it's not a big wine at all. Medium bodied at the most. Two years old, it's already soft and drinkable, very apparent, very balanced and approachable wine. Gorgeous wine. We rate it at 92 and we say drink it from now until 2008. It's not 28 rather. It's not a long term wine. It's a medium term wine. It's only 26 bucks a bottle. So it's good value. It, it's a top rank wine. It was rated number two out of the 22 Cabernet Francs we tasted from all over Australia in 2018 vintage. So good value wine, bright, delicious, soft, uh, easy drinking wine. And we asked the winemakers, of course, to recommend a, a dish for their wine. Rob Deletti, the winemaker, has said moussaka, made with lamb and eggplant, obviously, traditional Greek dish. Um, I think that would be perfect with this wine because it's not such a hearty dish and this is not such a big wine. You need to match the weight of the dish to the weight of the wine. Medium bodied wine, medium flavoured dish. He's also suggested a vegetarian moussaka. So frankly, I prefer it with, uh, with the lamb in it, but um, can't see anything wrong with a vegetarian moussaka. That would be pretty good as well. So delicious wine and, um, and very, very affordable. So we will move on to wine number two. Put the three drops here. And the wine number two is Redmond. Redmond, Coonawarra. Probably the first wine I ever bought to sell it by the case was a Redmond Claret and Redmond Cabernet, actually. Claret was the Shiraz, what they used to call the Shiraz in the old days. This is the 1970s, late 1970s. I'm dating myself. Um, but Red, there's no name in Coonawarra that is more synonymous with the region than Redmond. And the reason is that Bill Redmond arrived in the district in 1901, a long time ago. He was only 14 years old. He didn't uh, have any interest or knowledge of wine, but he started work in the winery that was owned by the founding father of Coonawarra Wine District, whose name was uh, John Riddick, of course, very famous name in the district. And after seven years working there, he actually, he and his family bought a vineyard and started making wine themselves and selling it. They sold it in bulk to begin with. They sold grapes and they sold bulk wine to other people, but eventually they started their own brand. And when Bill's son, Owen, came along, um, Owen was the first Redman that I really got to know. Um, he, uh, he uh, together they started the Rouge Homme brand, Rouge Homme being French for Red Man, little play on words. And they continued that business for a while. They sold it in 1965 to Lindemann's. And Rouge Homme became a Lindemann's brand from then on. But the Redmonds, crafty people that they were, uh, immediately bought another vineyard, which was owned by one of their growers, built a winery and established Redmond Wines, which is what we know today. Owen's uh, two sons, Bruce and Malcolm, have been running the show since Owen departed. And Bruce is the winemaker. And Bruce's two sons, who are um, Michael and... Um, and mm, can't remember his name now. Terrible. Dan, of course. Dan. Uh, Dan and Mike are the two new generation, the fourth generation of Redmond family who are now in harness. All very good. So the, the legend continues and 
we can expect to see more and more great wines coming out of there. They are red by name and red by nature, so they don't make any white wines. I can't remember seeing a single white wine produced by the Redmonds, so they, they do stick to their knitting. Uh, they have added some uh, Merlot. Uh, they, do, they produce all their wines from Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Shiraz, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and so red wine is very much the thing. The only concession to modern, modern marketing is a rosé, which of course is now made from Shiraz as well. But for a long time, they made just two wines, a Shiraz and a Cabernet, and the Shiraz was known as a Claret, would you believe, which gives us uh, an insight into the style. It was more of a medium, light to medium bodied Claret style wine, what was then termed a Claret style wine. And even today, the wines are modest in alcohol. This wine we've got here is only 12.8% alcohol. And considering that modern Kunawaras are more normally 14, 14 and a half and even higher, that's quite, quite a modest alcohol, but that's the Redmond style. So let's taste it. Um, again, beautiful colour. It's a year older than the other one, 2017. It's also a very good year in the district. Um, good, color, good depth of colour and good hue, nice and youthful. And the nose is uh, so, so fascinating and it couldn't be more different to the Three Drops Cabernet Franc. It's certainly got the Cabernet family aromas. There's cedar and there's black currant, but there's also all of these um, uh, more savoury characters, briary, brambly, undergrowth characters, which are really fascinating and which add a, another level of interest. You don't just want the fruit flavour. That would be simple or straightforward. But this is quite a complex one. And um, again, it's not a big wine. It's a medium bodied wine, medium to full. Uh, because it's Cabernet, there's quite a firm finish to it. It's got plenty of tannin and the acidity is quite, quite noticeable. This is the wine that leaves you with a refreshing finish because of the acidity. And the acidity and the tannin will help that age really well and help it go with food, of course. Give it the, uh, the backbone to go with food. We rated that wine 95 and it was a top value and top rank wine. Top value because it's quite inexpensive, $30. Um, and it was rated number one of 18 2017 Cabernet Sauvignons from Kunawara. So that's a pretty high recommendation considering <laughs> Kunawara and, and Cabernet are synonymous. Um, we are suggesting drink it from now until 2030, but I think you can add another 10 years onto that easily. We asked the guys at uh, Redmond's, Bruce and Malcolm to recommend a dish to go with this wine and they said roast pork belly. Sounds good to me. Pork belly, plenty of fat as well as protein and the fat and the protein and the meat will go well with the tannins and, the, and the soften the slight astringency of that wine. It's a really good wine now. You can drink it with food now, no problem, but it will go on for a long, long time. It's a ripper. Okay, so moving on to question time. And um, let me see what we've got here. What is the oldest Australian red wine you have tried? Gosh, the old Australian red wine that I've tried. Um, I think I tried a 1909 Coonawarra once, um, and that was um, pretty tired, I've got to say. It was pretty, <laughs> it was a few years ago now, but. It was um, a relic. You know, some old wines are really just, uh, they're not particularly great to drink necessarily, but it's fascinating to taste them because of you know, the history that's behind them. This was a really old Kunawara, probably made by Bill Redman, um, and certainly a bit of Kunawara history. And um, when you think of what was happening at the time a really old wine was made, if you were alive, you can say, well, what was I doing in that year? And it takes you back. It's a trip down memory lane. And that's the fascination of drinking old wines to me. Um, and if the wine also tastes good, that's a bonus, frankly. Um, I had some 66 Mildara Cabernet the other day, which was you know, alleged down to the air and was absolutely completely over the hill. So you can have some disappointments too. Um, Mark Harrison says, what wines inspire you for the future of Australian red wines? 
where do I start? Um, I'm going to have to keep this short, otherwise it'd go all night. There are so many, Mark. There are so many great wines out there. People in every region of Australia are doing more, are doing better and better, putting more effort in. Um, yes, climate change is happening. The, the seasons are getting hotter and earlier. Uh, but winemakers somehow are coping with it and continuing to make terrific wine. Of course, too hot is better than too cold. Um, you can make, you can still make tasty wine if the season is a bit too hot, but if the season is too cold, it eh, doesn't work. Green fruit tastes green and horrible and stays that way forever. So, yeah, um, I think Grenache is coming a long way. Uh, the new varieties, the, the Italian varieties like Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Nero Davola, especially Nebbiolo, which is a really high degree of difficulty and difficult wine to produce well. And Australia is now starting to produce some decent ones, which is great to see. So that's our two questions for the moment. The rest of them can wait until next. Uh, we have our next break. I'll keep moving on, otherwise we'll get behind. The third wine we're tasting is from Langhorn Creek and it's called Lake Breeze. And Lake, Lake Breeze, it's a very old property. Uh, uh, 130 years, the Follett family have been producing grapes um, in Langhorn Creek. They haven't been making wine all that time. They've been making wine for 33 years. The current generation were the, uh, the ones who just start, started to make wine and who invented this label. Um, they still sell grapes to other people. But Lake Breeze, um, where do I start? It's, um, it's a very, very good wine growing region. It's probably the least understood and least recognized really good Australian wine region that there is. Um, why is that so? Because there aren't many wineries there, firstly. Most of the grapes that are grown there are sold to wineries in the big wineries in the other districts like the Barossa and they're shipped out and they're often blended. So Jacobs Creek has a lot of Langhorn Creek in it. You won't see the name on the label. That's the problem. So it's the great unknown wine region and produces some of the best value for money wines in Australia. I'm constantly banging the drum for Langhorn Creek. I believe in it. I believe, especially in the in Lake Breeze, I think they make fantastic wines and they're always good value. This is $25, this wine, and, you know, it's a gold medal wine. Um, uh, why is it called Lake Breeze? Because down south of Langhorn Creek is Lake Alexandrina. It's very close. The vineyards are right on the edge of Lake Alexandrina, which is where the Murray River empties into the sea. And the breezes, the, the, the winds that blow up off the lake, cool down what would otherwise be quite a, a hot region. So that's their sort of their Fremantle doctor or their southerly buster or whatever. That's what moderates the, uh, the climate there. So Langhorn Creek, there's no, no, there's no town called Langhorn Creek, by the way, and no creek called Langhorn Creek. The town, I'm sorry, the town is called Langhorn Creek, but there's no creek. Very strange. But um, there are two rivers, the Bremer River, and the Angus River. And the Bremer River is the one that Lake Breeze is on. And traditionally in, in Langhorn Creek region, the Bremer would flood every year, or every second or third year, and irrigate the vineyard land. And that's how they watered their vines. And they still do, but there isn't as much water coming down the Bremer as there used to be. Okay, um, so the Follett family, uh, three brothers run the place today. The winemaker is Greg Follett, who I think is an exceptional winemaker. General manager is Roger and the viticulturist is Tim. And they have 90 hectares of vines and I, they only use 40% of those for their own wines and they keep, needless to say, the best for themselves. Um, the fruit is quite old vines. They're 50 to 55 year old vines. This wine is produced from the, uh, the vines of that age, 45 to 50 years old. And it is a straight Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and let's taste it. I think it's a, I've already had a look at it. I think it's a very, very good wine indeed. Beautiful purple red color, limpid. You can see through it. It's not too dark, not too dense. But the aroma is just so lifted and fragrant and it has all sorts of herb characters, violets, um, blueberries, mulberries, all sorts of fruit and herb characters, but it doesn't have greenness to it. There's a bit of tobacco leaf and a bit of cedar in the mixture there, quite a remarkable nose. Hmm. 
So that is a medium to full bodied wine. It's not a blockbuster. It's um, a wine that you can approach now. It's a wine that has tannin, but they're soft, fine tannins. They don't dominate. It's not astringent. It's an elegant wine. And I've seen how some of these wines age and they age brilliantly. So we've said drink it from 2020 to 2032. It's only 12 years. It could last longer than that, no problem. We've scored at 95, which is a gold ribbon score. Very, very good score for a $25 wine. That gives it its ranking, its top value ranking, which is number one out of 16 Cabernets from the Fleurier region in 2018. Now you might wonder, well, this is Langhorne Creek. Where is the Fleurier? Well, the Fleurier is a super, a, a, a bigger region than the region of Langhorne Creek. It includes other parts of that area, the Fleurier Peninsula. Um, and it's um, that's a high ranking, a very high ranking. So lovely wine, elegant, um, and not as gum leafy. Sometimes uh, wines from this district are very eucalypt uh, scented. Um, we asked the winemaker what he would serve with this, and Greg Follett has said duck breast. He hasn't said how or what with, he just said duck breast. So I would suggest um, putting it on the barbecue or um, pan roasting it uh, and perhaps serving it with a, a sauce, which might be a demi glaze with a bit of um, uh, black currant or cherry uh, conserve thrown into it. You can just use jam. You can use blackberry jam, just a, a couple of spoonfuls of that in a reduction sauce, which would be made from reduced stock and, and wine would be a really good way to serve the duck. And it would go really well with that wine. So very good. Let's move on from Lake Breeze to we're getting into Shiraz now, so big change of style. This wine is from the Adelaide Hills. It is um, Mr. Riggs, Highballed Adelaide Hills Syrah, vintage 2017. Mr. Riggs, who is Mr. Riggs? Well, Mr. Riggs is a fellow called Ben Riggs, who is a very tall, very sturdy man, who, um, a big guy, a big guy with a big, Big voice, big handshake, and makes big wines. Um, he is, uh, he likes to think he makes wines that are unsophisticated and unpretentious and just wines that people would love to drink. And um, it's the kind of guy Ben is. He's, everybody likes Ben. He's been in the region for forever. I think when I first met him, he was a long time ago, he was chief winemaker at Wirra Wirra. And then he struck out on his own. And I think 2001 might have been the year that he started his own business, Mr. Riggs, and now he's got a huge number of wines that he produces. He, and he makes wines from Clare Valley down through the Barossa, Adelaide Hills, all the way down to Coonawarra. He gets his Cabernet from Coonawarra. So he tries to suit the grape variety to the region. Um, his Riesling, I think, comes from Clare. He might do an Adelaide Hills one too, I'm not sure. But this is this one is called Piebald Syrah. I'm not sure. I think Piebald is the name of a vineyard in the Adelaide Hills. But Syrah, he calls it Syrah and not Shiraz. He does make other Shirazes from McLaren Vale, for example, which is called Shiraz. And I think he calls this Syrah because he fancies it's a lighter, spicier, more fragrant, more elegant style, more akin to the northern Rhone wines of France, where they call Shiraz Syrah. It is a synonym for Shiraz. So um, that's Mr. Riggs and that's the, the Syrah. This wine is actually sourced from two vineyards in the Adelaide Hills, one in, at each end of the, the, the region, uh, one at Kite Po and the other one at Mount Pleasant. So um, he's got the best of both uh, ends of the Adelaide Hills there. And um, uh, it's a pretty smart wine. Let me taste it. Colour is really nice and dark and, and rich colour. Really, uh, you can tell you've got, you've got something good coming. The, the hue is bright. There's a nice purple tinge. And the nose, the nose is splendid Shiraz nose. It's got the spiciness of cooler, higher altitude vineyards, Adelaide Hills. But it's also got those earthy characters like... Um, um, graphite, uh, ironstone perhaps, but 
a sooty, smoky character, which is really classic South Australian Shiraz overtones, which um, I think is adds an extra layer to the wine. It's um, If it was just blackberries or just cherries, it would be a bit straightforward, but this is a complex wine. There's a tinge of licorice to it. Uh, let's taste it. Mm. Wow, now that's a real mouthful of wine. It goes to every corner of your mouth. It's rich, it's, it's full-bodied, it's lush. The fruit is just lush. It is soft and it has a sweetness to it. There's no sugar in there, but the ripe fruit just gives it this impression of sweetness, which is delicious. The tannins are very, very soft and the softness and fineness of the tannins is part of that impression of sweetness and gentleness that you get at the same time as you get this big delivery of intensity and power. That's a really smart wine. We scored at 96 out of 100 which is a high gold score. Uh, it's a top rank and a top value wine. Top value because it's 96 points and $30. 30 bucks for that, gosh, that's a really good bargain. Um, it was rated number two out of 39 Shirazes of that vintage that we tried from the Adelaide Hills, the 17 vintage. We suggested drinking it from, from now until 2027. That's only another seven years. I, I think it's got plenty more years in it than that, but that's probably the peak drinking period. Um, lovely wine. I would say um, that that will go with just about any kind of meat or, cheese or, or hard cheese that you want to put it with. We asked Ben Riggs what he thought it would go best with, and he said, cold weather, winter, go perfectly with delicious roast Lorac of lamb. Uh, rack of lamb, I totally agree. I love the way you can get a rack of lamb still pink in the middle and, and, cr and slightly charred and crusty and caramelised on the outsides if you do it properly. And if you serve that with, he hasn't suggested a sauce, but I'm going to suggest pesto. So if you have a, um, a, um, a reduction sauce with pesto, that, that will go really well with that. So... Excellent. So we're up to number four. That was number four. We can take a couple more questions now. Uh, let me see what's here. Um, we have a question here. How do you improve or train your taste buds for different grapes or wine? Uh, the best way to improve your palate is just to taste a lot of wine and never say no to a tasting opportunity, but always spit it out so you can still, you know, stay on your feet. Um, and talk to people who know more than you do about wine. This is the best way to learn anything. Pick the brains of people who know more than you do and you will learn. That's easy. But tasting, taste as much as you can and try and understand what it is you're tasting, why it tastes the way it tastes. Ben Hoare says, what do you think of the current stoush with China saying we dump cheap wine there? Well, I'm not sure how I can say this very concisely because that's a big subject. I don't believe we dump cheap wine there, but then I'm not really in a position to know. I can tell you that the price that Australian wine sells for is far higher in China than any of our other export destinations. So I would be very surprised if there's any dumping going on. Um, I don't think we should get, there's been a lot of hand wringing over this. People are saying, oh gosh, you know, we've had the fires and the smoke and the drought and then the COVID and now we've got this it's going to kill us, but it'll be at least a year before we know the upshot of this investigation that they've brought on. And, you know, these sorts of investigations happen all the time. And I wouldn't automatically assume that they're going to stop importing Australian wine. So, um, and Victoria says, um, what do you think the top three red varieties in Australia? Oh God, Victoria. Uh, no doubt that Shiraz is one of them. Cabernet Sauvignon is the second one. Um, red variety you're talking about. But for the third position, that's, that would be a bit more challenging. Um, I think we, I would be a bit um, adventurous to say Pinot Noir, but I'd like to say that Grenache and Grenache blends, if I can extend it to blends, they are, I think, something that Australia does really well, really well. Well, there are many others, of course, too. Okay, that's more, more than half past six. Time to taste some more wine. 
Um, oh, Richard O'Brien says, you haven't fed any Pinot Noir in your winter wines. Any Australian Pinots? There are lots of Australian Pinots that I like to drink during the winter, but we've just decided that it would be better to do big reds or bigger reds than, than most Australian Pinots. We will do Pinots some other time, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt at all. I love Pinot Noir. Um, <clears throat> so this wine, number four, number five wine is um, Hare's Chase. Hare's Chase, what a strange name for a wine. It's Barossa and it's the Hare's Chase Iron Scraper, even an, an even stranger name. It's a Shiraz from 2018 and I can try and fit this story in as quickly as I can, that here's Chase. Okay, uh, this vineyard is in the Western Barossa and a little town called Marananga. And this area of the Barossa is known for big, big, rich, ripe, powerful Shirazes. And there's a lot of ironstone in the soil. So it's really tough soil, hard soil, struggle town for vines to grow in that. But the vines that were on this property when Peter Taylor and his mates bought it, uh, Peter Taylor was an ex-Penfold senior winemaker. And when he bought this place, there was an old vineyard there that was over 100 years old. And these were dry grown vines, which the roots have to go right down deep into the soil to try and get the minerals and the water that they need to sustain themselves. And they curl around the rocks and they get under the, the, the red, uh, the, um, the, the, the ironstone rocks to try and find the moisture. So iron scraper. You can see where the iron's coming from. The scraper is because of their hairs. Now, hair is a, like a large rabbit, as you'd know. Hairs don't dig burrows. If a, hair, if a rabbit tried to dig a burrow in this soil, it would come out with blunt fingernails, that's for sure, because it's really hard soil. Good thing hairs don't dig burrows. Hairs dig, make a little hole, hollow in the earth and then hide with grass and so on, and that's where they hide. It's called a hide or a scrape. Uh, and that's where hares live. Um, there are hares apparently prolific in this part of the Barossa. Iron scraper, that's what a hare is apparently to these guys. So that's where the name comes from. So I mentioned that it was started by, the brand was started by Peter Taylor in the 1990s and, but recently he sold it. And it's now owned by a Chinese couple who also own another vineyard in the Barossa and they own a restaurant in Adelaide, I believe. Um, and so they're making a big investment in the area. And, um, but back in uh, 2018, when this wine was made, Peter was still involved. So he is the winemaker for this wine. Um, a long way of getting around to the fact that um, this is a really good part of the Barossa. Um, Torbrek is where they had their wines made. Torbrek's just down the road in the same sub-region of the Barossa, which is uh, Marananga. The Western Ranges. The vineyard is now 14 acres or 14 hectares with an average age of 20 years. So there's a lot of young vines there as well. Um, let's have a taste. This is their, this is a $35 wine. So it's not, not their cheapest and it's not their dearest wine. So a very dark color, a dark color with a tinge of black and a tinge of purple, typical of a wine from the Western Barossa. Sepult's Field, Grenock, Marananga, those sort of areas where the wines, it smells absolutely typical of wines from that area. It's got an a, a aroma of freshly turned earth. Uh, it's very earthy. It's graphite. It's got um, ironstone aroma. I mean, I always think that wines from this area have an ironstone smell, and maybe it's just because I know that they're grown on ironstone, but there is a definite ferrous character to the nose of these wines. And it's got tapenade, graphite, Vegemite, all those sorts of characters as well. Really unusual. Um, well, it's not unusual, but it's, it's, it's common for this area. There are blackberries and red fruits there too, but they are underneath this patina of all these other interesting savory elements. Let's have a taste. Hmm. Wow, that is a mouthful. You know you've tasted that. That is um, is a real backbone to that wine. It's got a lot of punch. Um, 
in fact, it's quite tannic. I think that wine really needs to be served with food. We'll get to that in a moment. But, gee, it's a good wine. Um, it was rated 96 by the Real Review, and it was rated number two out of 90 um, 2018 Shirazes from the Barossa. In fact, that's slightly historic because we've tasted over 100 of those 2018 Shirazes now, and I think it's still number two. So it's partly the score it got, but it's also the fact that it's not expensive that gives it that high ranking. So it's a top rank and top value wine, according to the Real Review system. And we said drink it from now until 2030. Um, I think probably I would prefer to keep that for a year or two before I drink it. But if you drink it now, certainly you need to have it with food and anything with a lot of protein in it is, is important there. Peter Taylor, the winemaker, has said pasta with a ragu. In other words, um, a bolognese sauce with meat, meat and tomato and herbs. Um, oh, he's, he hadn't, he's had another go. He said a roast beef or a steak as well. Well, yes, of course, all of those things would be really good uh, with this wine. So that is a, a really, really interesting wine with character. That wine has character. Not all wines at 35 bucks have that much character. So moving on to wine... This next one, and we're still in the Barossa, but we are in Eden Valley this time, which is the high country behind the Barossa. So the region is still Barossa, but it's um, Eden Barossa consists of two regions the, the Barossa Valley and the Eden Valley. And this wine is um, Phil Lehman's wine, Max and Me, the House Blend, Bungary Vineyard. Cabernet Sauvignon Shiraz 2018. Now, I'm really glad this wine is in here because it's a Cabernet Shiraz and the Cabernet Shiraz is a very Aussie blend. It's, some, it's a blend that I have a, a great affection for. Um, going back a bit to Phil Lehman, who is the winemaker. Um, Phil Lehman is the son, the youngest son of Peter Lehman, uh, who needs no introduction. Um, Max and Me is the name of his brand. Who's Max? No, it's not his wife. His wife's name is Sarah. Uh, Max is the dog. So it's Phil and his dog, basically, uh, the brand. Um, and the house blend because they probably serve it at home. But Boone Gary Vineyard is the vineyard that they own themselves and they live at the vineyard. So this is near Cainton, which is um, down the Henschke end of the Eden Valley region. Uh, a pretty good place to be growing grapes and making wine, I would have thought. So, um, so Phil Lehman, yep, Phil uh, Lehman started his career as a winemaker at Yolumba, the same place that his father started his career, oddly enough, uh, probably not by accident. Um, so he made wine at Yolumba and he went to um, various other wineries, including Peter Lehman Wines for a period. And then he ended up at the Hesketh Families Company, which makes... Vickery, Parker Coonawarra Estate, uh, St. John's Road and various other brands. And he made quite an impact there, but then he decided he wanted to go off and do his own thing and um, you know, just, just concentrate on his own vineyard. So that's what Max and Me is. They, um, uh, I think they're doing a terrific job. I mean, obviously he's got winemaking in his blood and um, it's quite a, a wordy label, but the important things are that it's a Cab Shiraz and it's from Eden Valley. And Eden Valley wines are slightly different to Barossa Valley. It's a, it's a much higher altitude area. So we're looking at um, upwards of four, 400 to 450 metres, I would say. I'm not sure. Yes, 460 metres this vineyard is. And when you consider that um, Pusey Vale is about the same height, which is obviously where they grow great Riesling for your lumber. Um, and you go down the hill to the Barossa floor and the altitudes are more like between 100 and 200, 200 at the very most on the hilly parts of uh, the north and western Barossa. So there's quite a difference in altitude and that gives you a much cooler climate and the grapes ripen later and you get more aromatics in the fruit and in the wine. And with Shiraz, that tends to mean that instead of having blackberries and chocolate and dark plums and so on, you tend to get spices and you get 
her, dried herbs and you get all sorts of more, more lifted aromas. Red fruits, red raspberries is a good descriptor for a lot of Eden Valley wines. Um, so let's have a taste of this one. Again, a beautiful colour. Wow, that is such a bright and youthful colour. You know that you're going to taste a fresh wine when you see that colour. And yeah, you can smell this dried herb thing, which I think is very typical of Eden Valley. Um, Stephen Henschke is always talking about the dried herb characters in his wines, and, and definitely they're there. Um, there would be the raspberries and blueberries in there as well, but you might have to give it some air, decant it and let it sit for a while to reveal those a bit more. And certainly if you aged it for a few years, those characters would come to the fore as well. The oak is there, but it's very, very beautifully integrated. You don't, it's barely worth mentioning the oak. It's so beautifully integrated. Hmm. That is a beautiful one. It is so lush. The fruit is so lush. You can taste the Cabernet and the Shiraz. I think the Cabernet is giving it the blackberries, black currants, um, and, and perhaps some of those herb characters. And the Shiraz is giving it more of the spice and the earthy, earthy notes. Um, it's a complex wine. It's only two, two and a bit years old, and it's already pretty complex. Really entertaining wine. I can sit and sniff that for quite a while. And the flavor just, it's full body. It fills your mouth with flavor. There's a lot of tannin there too, but the tannins are so soft. They're velvety. Uh, they're not astringent. They're exactly what you want in a modern red wine. That wine drinks beautifully now, um, but it's going to last for at least 20 years. No problem. We've scored at 95. Um, and we've said drink now to 2028. Well, again, I think you can hold this wine for a lot longer than that if you want to. It scored um, number three out of 22 Cabernet blends from across South Australia in the 2018 vintage. So that's looking at Cabernet blends from all over South Australia, not just the Barossa and Eden Valley. It's a top, top rank wine and um, it's uh, $40 a bottle. I think that's very good value indeed. That's a lovely, lovely wine. I reckon Peter Lehman would be proud, very proud. So we've asked Phil and Sarah Lehman to nominate their food match, and they've said grilled lamb loin chops with hummus. Hmm, I don't think I've ever had hummus with lamb chops, but I'm going to try it after this recommendation. And a salad inspired by Alimentari. I think Alimentari is a cookbook, but I'm not totally sure. It's got inverted commas around it. So, yeah, I think um, salad, well, salad's um, kind of like the, um, the icing on the cake. What you want is the protein, which is provided by the lamb, and that wine would go beautifully with, with uh, that dish. Max and me. I'm not sure what's going to happen when Max is no longer with us. They don't last forever, dogs. Sorry about that, guys. Now, <laughs> okay, it's time for a couple more questions. And... Okay, Albert says, would you recommend barrel or barrique aging for these wines? Well, I would think, Albert, that all of these wines have been aged in oak, oak containers, oak barrels, um, but they would vary in size. For example, in the Barossa, they use hogsheads, which is a 300 litre barrel, and that's the preferred size of barrel in the Barossa. I'm not sure exactly why, it's just a historical accident, but most people use um, hogsheads, 300 litres, but some of them would be aged in barriques, and barriques are 228 litres and 225 or 28. Um, but quite often they would use a different, uh, they would use a range of barrel sizes. So they might use puncheons, which are 500 litres, quite a large barrel. And some of them might use really big barrels like 5,000 litres, uh, which don't give you any oak character at all. They're just a container. But some air gets in through the staves to help mature the wine. And that's the important thing about having it in barrels. It's not the oak character, but you can get oak character if you want it by using small barrels, which are also fairly new. Um, 
And John Irwin says, given the age of the wines you're tasting, do they feel they would benefit from decanting? And if so, how long? Well, the good thing is that um, like Max Schubert, who was the famous chief winemaker at Penfolds, he would decant every red wine that he served. He insisted on it. And if you look at the wines he made, Grange, Bin 707 and so on, they're all wines that do benefit from a bit of aeration. Um, the good thing about decanting young wines and aerating them is that they're not, going to get, they're not going to go flat if you give them too much time in the decanter. So you're not going to overbreathe them. So yes, I would recommend decanting these wines. Decanting is, it, it doesn't always improve the wine, at least not straight away, and, but you never know that until you've tried it. So you might as well try it. As well, it's also a bit of theatre. And if you've got people around for dinner, it's a good fun thing to do. It can add to the sense of occasion and the, you know, the drama. All good fun. So moving on to the second last wine. We're into Cabernet from Margaret River now. And this is a Cabernet Merlot, not a straight Cabernet, but a Cabernet Merlot. Evans and Tate Redbrook Estate Cabernet Merlot 2017. And of course, Cabernet was the variety that put Margaret River on the map. Cabernet Sauvignon is um, not, it's only one of several great varieties that are great in Margaret River, but it's probably the most, the variety that made Margaret River the most famous. And Evans and Tate. It's probably not as famous as Cullens and Mosswood and Vas Felix, but, it's, um, but it has a history that is almost as long. I think the first vines that were planted in this vineyard, Redbrook Vineyard, in 1974, and the, the region was only started in 67. So this is quite an early vineyard. It was started by two guys, two friends who are both named John, John Evans and John Tate, uh, who ran it for a number of years. Then eventually they sold it and it's had a, a couple of, it's had a bit of a checkered career since then, but now it's in the hands of Peter Fogarty, who is uh, a Perth-based wine entrepreneur. That's probably a good way of describing Peter Fogarty. Peter Fogarty owns, is, is come up recently to own a lot of wine properties. He's really investing big in the wine industry. He owns uh, Lakes Folly in the Hunter Valley. He owns Millbrook in the Perth Hills. He owns Deep Woods Estate in Margaret River and Evans and Tate in Margaret River. He also recently bought Dalwini, which is in the Pyrenees, and he has been investing in, in Tasmania in the Coal River Valley. So um, that might be his venture, uh, off, his foray off into, into Burgundy varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. We'll have to wait and see. So Redbrook Vineyard, um, it's, uh, uh, I think, has always produced really good wine, especially Cabernet. And this is the 17... Cab Merlot. When I see Cab Merlot, I usually expect the wine to be a bit lighter and a bit softer than a straight Cabernet Sauvignon from the same vineyard. That's just historically the way it has turned out in Australia. It doesn't have to be that way. And there's nothing light or effete about this wine. It is a full bodied wine. Um, so it's not always th the truth, but generally it would be. That Merlot is a softening variety anyway. It tends to be used as a softener to make the wine more approachable at a younger age. When I sniff that wine, I think I'm straight going to Margaret River because I can smell not quite the seaside, but the, the seaweed. Believe it or not, there's a, a, a character, it's almost like peat. Peat, which is, uh, you know, in peaty malt whiskey from Scotland, there's an iodine kind of character, which seaweed kind of character. Call it nori, if you know what nori, Nori rolls in Japanese food, that dried seaweed smell of nori is really strong in some Margaret River wines. And this wine has a touch of it. It's not dominating, it's not unpleasant, it adds a little extra interest to the wine. So there's blackberries, black currants, cedar, and all of those things that you usually get in Cabernet. But there's this little extra patina of... Um, of nori or seaweed character, which I find quite fascinating and as long as it's not dominant. Mm. Gorgeous wine, lots of fruit, delicious cassisi, black currantty flavor, fruit sweetness on the palate, not sugar, but sweet fruit from ripe grapes, lovely. Soft tannins, 
it's certainly approachable, but it's um, it's got plenty of backbone as well. It'll age really well too. 96 out of 100 is what we scored it. And we gave it, um, that gives it a rating of number two out of 36 Cabernet blends from Margaret River in the 2017 vintage. So that's a top rank score. And uh, it's a $40 wine, so it's very affordable. And we've said drink it now until drink it in 2000, 2040. So 20 years from now, no problem with that. It's um, Margaret River wines age beautifully, they really do. And I've tasted some old uh, Evans and Tate cabs and they've tasted and been wonderful at 20, 30 years of age, no problem. Okay, moving on to the final wine of the day is Brash, Brash Vineyard. So we've gone from Evans and Tate, which is one of the earliest vineyards in the region, to quite a quite a new entrant in, in, in Margaret River. But you can see by the number of gold medals down the side, but they've already established themselves really, really well. And I think their first vintage was um, it was established in 1999. So it's only 20, the vineyard's only 21 years old. Um, it has 18 hectares of vines and they sell all but 10% of them, which they keep for their own label. And the website is very coy. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't give us any names, but it says some of their grapes going to some of the most famous Cabernets of the region. So other people buy their grapes to blend. And Brashfin, it is in, uh, in the north part of Margaret River near Yellingup. So the, if you think that the, the, so the colder parts of Margaret River are the southern parts down near Cape Lewin um, and Augusta. And if you go north um, through Willyabrup to Yellingup and Dunsborough, you find the, the more the warmer vineyards, which tend to ripen Cabernet the most consistently. So the best Cabernets do come from that top third or top half, I suppose, of Margaret River region, maybe the top third, the most northerly third. Um, so straight Cabernet, good vineyard, good part of Margaret River, good grape growers. Who makes the wine? Well, they don't actually make the wine themselves, but the wine is made by Bruce Dukes who is probably the, um, the most um, uh, accomplished, well, I don't think there's much doubt, he is, he is probably the most accomplished contract winemaker in the district. And um, he, uh, he does a great job. He makes wine for himself under his own label, uh, as well as various other small vineyards, and this one included. So, it's a beautifully made wine. You can just, you know, from every point of view, it's a beautifully turned out wine. Good color, good depth of color, good purple tint. Um, Cabernet, it's just, Cabernet screams out of that wine. Whereas the previous wine had that, that seaweedy touch to it, that earthy herbal touch. This one is more pure cassis, more black currants, um, a touch of Ribena perhaps, um, cedar, blackberries, blueberries, black currants, all of those things you can find in this wine. Gorgeous. There's a touch of dustiness from the oak there, which is very much a part of the wine. Um, beautiful wine. Let's have a taste. Mm. Excellent. Full bodied, concentrated flavour. Really, really lush Cabernet fruit flavour. That beautiful sweet blackberry, blackcurrant thing is happening in there. And it lasts for a long time after it's gone from your mouth. We scored at 96 out of 100, which is a very high gold score, obviously. And it's number two out of 60 uh, Cabernets from that vintage in Margaret River. That's the 17 vintage and it's a top rank score. So $45 a bottle perfectly good price I think drink now until 2030 even longer than that 2035 40 no problem it seems like a long way away but it's only 20 15 20 years away isn't it um Nick Butler yes rated at 96 and the food match we asked Bruce Dukes the naturalist um from naturalist vintners which is the winery where the wine is made what he would serve with that that wine, he said, roast duck with plum sauce 
or roast lamb with mint sauce. Okay, so there's two options there. Uh, I think either of those would go well. I'm sort of steering towards the lamb myself, but the duck would be perfectly fine. So, yeah, no problem with that. That's an excellent wine, and I really think that, um, that it's just absolutely typical of Margaret River. It's a beautiful wine. So we've only got a couple of minutes to go, so there's just enough time for another question or two, I think, before we sign off. And... Um, there's a lot of questions from someone called Susan here. Um, I think I've already answered one of hers. She says, do you drink all the wines afterwards? Um, some of them we do. Yeah, I mean, we have a bit of each. We'll sit around after, after this and have a meal. And um, my team are all here and they'll be uh, joining in. And uh, we will probably... What are we having? We're having chicken. I don't think it's going to go. It's not the perfect thing to have with these, but it'll be fine, I'm sure. Um, and, um, yeah, you can't, you can't waste them, can you? I mean, really, you've got, to, you've got to have a drink of some of them. John Smith says, are the wines on the shelves behind you your drink now quaffing wines or are they empty? No, they're not empty. They're all full and they're all unopened. They are wines that are waiting to be tasted. And each, each of those pigeonholes has a different grape variety in it. So, you know, that's, this is one of the holding pens here for the <laughs> real review tasting sample. So I think we've um, probably done our time. I would just like to say that, um, that uh, oh, one more question perhaps. When you rate a wine, do you take the cost of the wine into consideration when you're tasting, when you're rating it? No, we don't. No, the ratings are absolute. That's a very important point. Um, which is why we have all these little, little things on our app, the Real Review app, which tell you how the wine ranked in terms of value for money and how it ranked vis-a-vis -vis the other wines of its type from its district and, and variety and, and vintage. So there, you can look at wines from many different points of view and say, how does it rate compared to this, that, or the other thing? But the score itself is absolute. So, okay. Thank you for coming along, everybody. And it's been um, great to have your company. Thank you for joining in. Please subscribe to The Real Review if you don't already. And if you want to buy some of the wines, we don't sell wines, but we do have a click-through, which we call Cellar Door to Door. There's a little button on the reviews on our website where you can click on that and you'll go straight through to the winery where you can place your order. It's just a little thing we do to help you access wine. Please tune in again in two weeks because I'll be doing another one then and it's going to be on investment wines. And uh, so you can imagine we're going to have some pretty classic Australian reds that day. So... That's all from me. So have a good night and um, see you next time. Cheers.